I'm Justin Mott, professional photographer, not professional YouTuber, so my tips I think are kind of sexy, but my setup isn't always going to be that sexy. I'm not going to have great editing and all these cool graphics and different colored lights behind me shining around. I'm just all about tips. I'm a full-time working professional photographer. I've shot over 100 assignments for the New York Times, and my channel is dedicated to gear reviews, photography tips, business advice, BTS of me on shoots, all sorts of photography stuff. So. Anything photography related, we talk about here. And this is my mailbag series where I answer your questions from around the world. I take my five favorite questions from people that ask me on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, or even just on the street, tap me on the shoulder and say, hey Justin, I got a photography question for you. I will answer it. My five favorite for the week, I answer in this mailbag series. So let's get into it. And if you're enjoying this content so far, don't forget to take a moment to like and subscribe. It does help the channel and I do appreciate it. Thank you. This question comes from Simon Wernofsky and he asked me, when do you find yourself using the Leica M10 over the Leica M10D? So for those of you not familiar with the Leica system, the Leica M10D is a digital camera without an LCD screen. Let that sink in. I know a lot of you would think that's crazy. It is my go-to camera. That's what I use for about 90 to 95% of my work. That's this camera right here a eight to nine thousand dollar camera without a LCD screen. I know it sounds a bit insane. My backup camera is a Leica M10 which essentially is the same exact camera, same exact build but it just has a screen on the back. You might ask yourself why have one camera with a screen and the other one without a screen? Why don't I just get two with a screen or two without a screen? Valid question, totally understand it. So I use the Leica M10 as my backup camera, but I do take it out for, for two specific reasons. I'll take it out when I'm covering an event, something that's happening with a lot of people, and I, I can't necessarily get into the right position I wanna be in, and I, can't, I don't have time to change lenses. That's when I'll have two camera bodies on me. That's not typically the way I like to work. So I did use this system, the two camera body system, for example, when I was in Kenya, I was covering a rhino procedure. There was a lot of people, there was other photographers. It was tough to get in position. So in that situation, I had the Leica M10D with my trusty 35 millimeter on it. And then I had my Leica M10 with a 75 millimeter on it. Different focal lengths, so I don't have to take too much time to change lenses. If I just want to capture shot, boom, boom, boom. I don't normally have to do it that way though. I normally just go my 35 and I switch when I want to switch and I move like that. But that's one situation. The second situation I would use is when I really am in a tough, tough focusing situation. So one of those situations would be when I'm shooting macro. I have a Leica L Pro adapter, which basically screws on to the front of different lenses. It has different step up rings and it turns them into essentially a macro lens. So in those situations, it's really, really hard to focus. I use it when I'm photographing details on an animal or if I, you know, like getting close to the eye or getting close to their hands or, or if I'm photographing food for a travel story or these little details and I really wanna get close, Tough to focus with the M10D there. That's when I take out the Leica M10 because it has a screen. I can check the focus. I can make sure I got it right. And another situation would be when I'm shooting through things a lot often, like I'm photographing animals and they might, behind, they might be behind a fence or something like that, or I like to frame through things. And sometimes it's really hard to focus in the foreground with shooting through a viewfinder like that. So that's, that's another situation where I might take out the Leica M10 and use it. But most of the time, the Leica M10 is a very expensive backup camera that I keep in my bag or in my hotel room if I'm close to shooting. I just like to have less on me at all times. So those are situations where I'd use the Leica M10. But again, like I said, most of the time using the Leica M10D. And the second question comes from Sundong J, S-O-N-D-O-N-G-J apostrophe S. His question is, skills or devices are more important for photography? Thank you. Well, thank you for saying thank you. Um, it's a great question, but a very easy one for me to answer. Skills are more important. I don't care what camera you have. The best photographer in the world has a crappy camera. They'll do a fantastic job. The worst photographer in the world has the best camera. They won't do a good job. It's as simple as that. What's going to make you a good photographer is good instincts, good skills, and just a lot of experience. Taking the time to go out there and shoot, getting those reps in. More time you shoot, just like anything else, you will get better. So put your time, put your effort, put everything you can into shooting. If you can change your aperture, change your shutter, put your ISO in, that's all you need in your camera. I mean, everything else is, is, is nice to have. Again, I have nice equipment, but don't necessarily need it to get better. You will make yourself better by just practicing. So an emphatic skills will make you better 
100%. I don't care what anyone tells you, skills are more important than gear. Next question comes from Ozzy and he asks, do you shoot film? I get asked this question a lot because I'm a Leica shooter. A lot of people think, oh, you must shoot film. And because I shoot with a Leica M10D without a screen, people think, oh, you must love film. Actually, I don't. I do come from a weird hybrid area where I started my career in photography shooting film, but I didn't develop it myself. I know that sounds weird, but I had it developed at the lab at my school or I paid for a lab to do it. I don't enjoy that process. I like the process of slowing down. This is weird for people because people that like film like, like the process of slowing down, like it all sounds familiar. I like the process of slowing down. I like the process of minimalistic gear. I like to not be looking at my camera constantly when I'm shooting, so that's why I like this camera. But I don't like film because I don't enjoy post-processing much. Never enjoyed it in Photoshop, don't enjoy it in Lightroom. I have to hate it, but I don't spend a lot of time in there. I come from a documentary background. I come from a photojournalism background, so I, I don't spend a lot of time in post-production. I also do commercial work, but to be honest, for a lot of my heavy post-production commercial work, I outsource it. I don't enjoy that part of the process at all. What I do like in the post-production process is sequencing my images to tell the story. That's what I like. I like going through the images, sitting with the images, looking at them, and seeing how they come together as a cohesive story. So for that reason, I don't shoot film. I totally respect the people that do. I respect the process. I understand the process. I just know myself. I'm not patient enough for that. I like to put all my efforts into shooting, and then afterwards, I just thinking about my next story, thinking about what else I'm gonna shoot. The next question comes from Kiers Bay. He asked me, how did you discover and refine your visual editorial style? That's a great question, it's a complicated question, but I'll try to give you a simplified answer. I do come from a background in documentary photography and photojournalism, so I was heavily influenced by a lot of the great photographers in that genre. So photographers from Magnum, photographers from Seven, a lot of those photographers really influenced me early on in my career and still to this day. And not only in my photojournalism work, but when I shot wedding work, I had a very strong influence from them. And when I shoot commercial work, still to this day, there's a very, very strong influence in the way I want to capture light and the way I want to tell a story, even with my commercial images. So, Early on in my career, and still to this day, I, I really looked up to James Noctway, the famous conflict photographer for Time Magazine. Uh, I really loved his work. I really respected that it seemed like in all the big news stories, all the big historical events, everyone was looking this way, he was looking this way. He, everyone was looking for that one shot, he was looking to tell the story in multiple shots. And he always found the art and the beauty in everyday life, and I really, really love that. I respect his approach, how he approaches his subjects, how he works with them, how he kind of earns that space when he gets close to his subjects. And I really always respected and admired his style, the way that he captured shadows, the way that he really set the tone and the mood for his photos, the way he captures light. And that stays with me to this day. Day. I like to think that I'm always evolving as a photographer because I don't just stick with that influence and I haven't been stubborn with that style of photography. I try to grow in my work. I try to get influence from, from not just other photographers but other artists and I try to look around constantly to be influenced. Uh, you know, I look for the fashion photography, fine art photography, painters, architecture. I just look for different things to draw inspiration. So I would say it's always an ongoing process. For me, you know, starting heavily in that natural light, natural moment sort of background of photography that has had a strong influence on me to this day, but I've also grown and, and I constantly strive to refine and I constantly strive to improve my photography. So, so I hope that answers your question. And the last question comes from Natalia Francis and she asks, how can I capture the true color of the sun during sunset? It's a great question. Um, it's always hard because a lot of cameras come with these presets to, to sort of enhance your photo, right? Vividness, more saturation. So the first thing you can do if you're using a proper dedicated camera, you can go into the picture profile and just set everything to neutral. A lot of them come preset with a picture profile that's really heavy, like you might see landscape or vivid, and it, they tend to be heavy contrast, heavy saturation, which won't give you a natural look if that's what you're going for. Problem is, is most people aren't going for that. Most people want heavy, heavy post-production. But I like a more natural color palette, so I will set my cameras to a neutral setting, so nothing's bumped up, and then in post-production, if, if I still feel like it's too much, I'm more likely to desaturate than I am to saturate an image to get what I feel is a natural sunset. I'm, I'm so sick of overdone, crazy, photoshopped, unrealistic sunsets. Not my thing at all. For those of you out there, that's fine. It's just, I, you know, again, I come from a journalism background, so I like natural is better. So if you're using a professional camera, change your, change your picture profile setup. If you're using a camera phone like an iPhone, like they want that vivid look, they're all trying to match each other with like more color, more saturation. So what you can do there is just in post-production, take your saturation down a little bit, take the contrast down a little bit, and you'll have a more natural sunset if you're using a camera phone. So thank you guys for your questions this week. Keep them coming. Like I said, every week I do my five favorite questions. You can ask me anywhere, in person or online. Thank you guys for tuning in. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and have a wonderful day.